All right, so we are going to continue to talk about diabetes monitoring. Um, I talked a little bit in class about needing to monitor blood sugar and kind of the fact that Medicare will pay for one strip for a patient with type two diabetes and four strips for a patient with type one diabetes. Um, for the patient with type one, this usually equals the patient maybe taking a fasting blood sugar and then maybe before breakfast, before lunch and before dinner. But if you aren't able to check as often, you don't know what happens after those meals. Um, you, don't have the, you don't know what happens in the middle of the night. You don't know what happens between meals. You don't know what happens with exercise when you're sick, et cetera. So sometimes people are very limited by their insurance policies as to how often they can check. Um, other times, for example, private insurance might provide additional coverage for test strips. Your doctor may be able to write additional kind of justification for more test strips. So sometimes you might be able to get all the test strips you need, but then people might not want to actually check that often because it does actually, in my opinion, not everybody's, but it, it does hurt a little bit to prick your finger. Um, and it's not the most natural thing to do. So you have all sorts of kind of disparities between what should be done, what's encouraged by insurance, what's paid for by insurance, and kind of what the client or the patient actually can or will do. Continuous glucose monitoring is a really good way to monitor blood sugar because it's continuous. And I know that Sherry talked quite a bit about that and using that blood glucose monitor, and we'll get into it coming up. Hemoglobin A1C we've discussed a little bit, and then urine levels of blood glucose and ketones would be kind of um, tested secondarily to blood sugar. So you would always kind of test a blood sugar before you would then go to test urine levels of ketones or blood sugar. So check their blood sugar. Some recommendations when you wake before meals, two hours after meals, this would be considered postprandial at bedtime and the middle of the night. So this would be fasting before breakfast, lunch, and dinner, after breakfast, lunch, and dinner, at bedtime and in the middle of the night. Also, if you check and you're high, you should recheck. If you check and you're low, you should recheck. And if you're sick, you should check more often. So you can see that for somebody who is having to do constant blood glucose monitoring using finger sticks, this would be multiple different checks or finger sticks per day. Some conditions that can occur, um, and one of them is a little more controversial than the other, but these are things that can occur to people that are sometimes considered curious. Like for example, they'll go to their doctor and they'll say, I don't understand why my blood sugar is so high before I've even eaten breakfast. Like I haven't even eaten anything. I don't really get why it's so high then. Um, things like that. So there's two kind of, I guess you could call them hypothesis, hypotheses or explanations um, for these patterns in blood glucose that we see. So the first pattern in blood glucose that we see is the somiagi effect. And that's shown on the far left picture with the green line. Um, the second pattern that we see is shown in both pictures and it's shown on the left with the red line. It's called the Dawn phenomenon. Um, or on the right, and it is part of the blue lines that are shown on the right. So they're a little different. And what happens in the dawn phenomenon is it has to do with these periods of hyperglycemia or high blood sugar in the morning. And like I said, this could occur even before you've eaten breakfast. So you wake up, you check your blood sugar, that would be your fasting blood sugar, and it's already high. And you're like, what the heck? Why is my blood sugar already high? Um, I haven't even eaten yet. And it can continue to rise till after breakfast. Um, so what is the cause for this? I'll tell you, we don't exactly know the causes for all these, but we have some really good guesses. So for example, what happens in a person without diabetes is we have a little bit of um, glucose that's circulating 
in our body during the night. Um, and we have some increases of free glucose circulating due to nocturnal spikes of like growth hormone and nocturnal spikes of like cortisol. Because remember that growth hormone and cortisol are counter-regulatory to insulin. So instead of bringing blood sugar down, they would bring blood sugar up a little bit. Um, so that happens to everybody during the night. And the thought is that we want to have our blood sugar a little bit elevated in the mornings, not a lot, but just a little bit in case you know, going back to our Paleolithic days, some sort of emergency happened while we're asleep. We want to have that fuel available to our cells in case we needed to use it in an emergency. So we want to have like our gas tank full. Um, in people who do not have diabetes, just before they wake or in the dawn, right before the sun comes up, which would be our physiologic time of waking, we secrete insulin. And the insulin helps to counteract the slight increase of blood sugar that's occurred during the night. And so for a person who does not have diabetes, when they wake up, their blood sugar is back at a normal level because um, their body has responded to the high blood sugar over the night. It's identified that no, there wasn't this emergency. It didn't need to use it. And it secreted insulin to bring it back down. What happens in people who do have type one diabetes is that they still have those nocturnal spikes of growth hormone and cortisol, which cause some higher blood glucose levels. But since they don't produce insulin, they're not able to have that response to them in the morning by producing insulin to help bring the blood sugar levels back down. And so the result of that is the blood sugar continues to climb, um, driven by these counter-regulatory hormones that peak at night. And then if you add breakfast to the mix, which is often carb-containing meal, it can become even higher. Um, and so that would be called the DOM phenomenon. And I, you know me, I'm good for my kind of cheesy ways to remember things. So I think of the DOM phenomenon as um, being high DOM, like your blood sugar is high in the morning. I think there was a movie called High Dawn or something. Um, but high DOM is the DOM phenomenon. So your blood sugar is high when you wake up before breakfast. Um, and it didn't happen because of hypoglycemia. So you can see overall in the dawn phenomenon, the blood sugar didn't really get too low. It got a little bit low, then it spiked, then it got a little bit low, then it spiked, but it really didn't do this drastic drop with the dawn phenomenon. It was just high. And so um, how do you treat this? Uh, exercising at night can help. Higher protein meals at night can help. Um, and also adjusting insulin doses so that maybe they cover this patient for the morning times when they wake up. Somiagi effect. So some experts say that the somiagi effect isn't actually um, a real thing. And so it's a little bit of, an, of a debate. But what happens in the somiagi effect, and I remember the somiagi effect as so low. So dawn phenomenon is high dawn. Somiagi effect is so low. So what happens with the somiagi effect is Again, you do have a high blood sugar in the morning, but the high blood sugar in the morning is the direct response to a low blood sugar at night. Um, so this is different than the dawn phenomenon where you kind of had an increased blood sugar at night that continues more into the morning. In the somiagi effect, we believe the high blood sugar is called a rebound hyperglycemia. And so, um, this can be due to your blood sugar dropping too low during the night. So if your blood sugar drops too low during the night, um, then, um, so as your blood sugar drops too low, your body releases hormones to counteract that effect. And um, the main counter regulatory hormones would be like glucagon, growth hormone, cortisol, et cetera, that are going to help to raise your blood sugar. So you increase secretion of those in much higher amounts um, to respond to this low blood sugar level. And then you have this rebound effect where now you have excessive glucagon in the system and you still don't have insulin. So the blood sugar is increased. So those are the dawn phenomenon and the somiagi effect. Both will result in people having a high morning blood sugar, um, but they have kind of different causes during the night. Another thing that can happen with the somiagi effect is perhaps a patient gives themselves too much insulin right before they go to bed, which causes their blood sugar to go low. And the, 
then in response to that blood sugar, they will release the glucagon. Another cause of the somiology effect could be potentially um, exercising right before bed as well as taking insulin because exercise has the potential to drop blood sugar over many hours after it's even finished because those GLUT4s stay at the cell membrane longer. So sometimes people who have exercised at night and then taken their normal dose of insulin will have these very low blood sugars that happen in the middle of the night. And we actually hope that they're able to rebound from that, but they're actually not always able to rebound from that. Okay. So treatment, and I know that some of this might have been covered already with Sherry. So hopefully it's just a review and nothing new that you're learning. Some of the goals of treatment are listed there. So normal growth and development, that's mostly a concern when we have children or pregnant women with type one diabetes. We're not as concerned about adults growing and developing because we've assumed that most of that has been done already. And then coordinated team effort, you literally need every member of the healthcare team. You need the doctor, the dietitian, the certified diabetes educator, maybe nurse practitioner, um, the RN, the PA, PA is physician's assistant, um, the pharmacist, mental health, occupational therapy, maybe to train with um, monitoring. And then you probably need a social worker as well to help with insurance coverage, just adjustment to life, things like that. Some of the plan, or the plan always includes for type one insulin because they do not make their own insulin and exogenous means that it comes from outside the body, nutrition therapy and exercise. Types of insulin, again, this should be a review, um, but there are lots and lots of different types of insulin. Right now, we use something called recombinant human insulin, which we generally use E. coli and different bacteria that have been genetically modified to produce these insulin-like proteins, and they're grown in very large fermenter cells, and then that protein, which is insulin, is harvested from them. I actually worked in a biotech company that made similar products in the Bay Area. And um, so, yeah, so we use recombinant human insulin. This is good because we previously used insulin that was harvested from the pancreases of dogs and pigs um, and horses and all sorts of different animals. But now we can kind of genetically engineer this insulin. So that's really good. So this would be, I'm not going to get political here, but if you're anti-GMO, uh, <laughs> thinking about GMO E. coli, you might have a more open mind because they help produce insulin and many of the other drugs that we take. Um, so insulins are classified based on how fast they act, um, what their peak time is, like do they reach their peak as far as lowering blood glucose within 10 minutes, within an hour, within 12 minutes, and how long they stay in the body. We adjust them based on age, based on insulin sensitivity, based on weight, based on hepatic function, based on renal function, um, all sorts of considerations. And a kind of general or very generic rule of thumb is we can take the individual's weight and we can, if the weight is in pounds, we can take their weight in pounds and divide it by four to get a starting dose of insulin, or we can take their weight in kilograms and multiply it by 0.55 to get a starting dose. So we can do weight in pounds divided by four or weight in kilograms times 0.55 to get a starting dose. This is a chart from the internet and there are many similar charts like this. Um, the charts can change semi-regularly as new products become on the market. Um, but this is a very standard chart. There's one in your book too. And it's looking at the different types of insulin and categorizing them by their action time and their action type. So rapid acting insulins are going to be acting very, very quickly. Um, Short acting insulins are going to peak between two and a half to four hours. Intermediate are generally going to peak between four to 12 hours. Um, on this, it actually shows a little shorter for the peak effect. Um, long acting insulins, either no peak, which is Lantus, this is probably the most common long acting insulin prescribed, or three to nine hour peak, Levamir. I don't see that prescribed as much. And then Oops, sorry. There are different combinations of insulins as well. So you can have a mix that's like 
a rapid acting insulin um, with kind of a more intermediate acting insulin. So you have treatment right away, but you also have extended treatment. So it doesn't just treat and then disappear or become metabolized by your body. Um, the most common ones that I see generally used are Lispro, Aspart, Humalog, Novolog, um, sometimes Humalin or Novolin. And those would be done for um, bolus insulin, which we're going to talk about. And then I also most commonly see Lantus as long acting. Those are probably my most common, commonly seen insulins that people use. Sherry probably talked about that as well. This is a chart taking those different types of insulins and showing you kind of when their peak is, which would be the very top of the color, and then how long they last. So if you're taking something like gar Glargine, which is Lantus, it will last a very, very long time. It will last almost all day long. Um, it takes it about four to six hours to peak, depending, um, but it doesn't actually peak, it just plateaus. So that one says no peak because it's just a plateau, but it takes it a little while to get to that level. If you're doing a rapid acting insulin, it's going to peak quite quickly and then come down. Um, and so often what people will do is they'll have one or two doses of a long acting insulin, maybe um, one in the morning or one at night or potentially one at night that covers them all the next day. Um, and then they'll add to that rapid acting or short acting insulin to cover their meals. Generally it's rapid acting, but sometimes they could add short acting as well. So a little bit more on the insulin. And again, this is some of the stuff I just said and kind of how we figure this out. So initial insulin regimens are determined by body weight, but obviously not all people are the same and body weight does not tell us body composition. It doesn't tell us activity level. It doesn't tell us kind of insulin sensitivity, et cetera. So we can make these initial starting doses. And then in the beginning of being diagnosed, somebody is followed very, very, very closely so that we can fine tune the initial dose to get them to what they really need. Um, so yeah, like I said, it's kind of adjusted based on blood glucose patterns. There are genetic variances between people with regards to absorption, um, distribution, metabolism, excretion, et cetera, how they'll kind of react to the insulin. But overall, we have pretty good rules of thumb. So I showed you the initial starting dose in uh, a few slides ago, and then this would be the total starting dose. And so if you have a total starting dose, you will divide that between the bolus and the basal insulin. Um, and so for an example, this guy, we could do a couple different things, um, but he, we could do a multiplication. So he weighs 63, and I don't have a very good writing tool on this computer, so I apologize. It was 63.4 kilograms. We could multiply this by 0 0.55. And what we get, hopefully you guys got this as well, um, is approximately 35 units. If you're using a vial and a needle to inject insulin, you're going to use a whole number of units. If you're using a continuous blood glucose monitor and um, an injection set that has a needle under your skin, that injection set and that injection device can actually be programmed to like 0 0.001 units of insulin, but we can't do that with an injection needle. So we'll just say 35 units of insulin. And honestly, um, I'd like you to know the formula, but that's as far as you need to go in this class. So what I'm going to do next is a little bit more than you need to know, but I'm going to show you anyways. So of this 35, we would take half of it to be the basal insulin and half of it to be the bolus insulin. So approximately 17 and a half units would be basal, and I could do like a B and an A and um, 17 and a half units 
would be bolus insulin. And you're like, what is basal? What is bolus? So I'm kind of going to get to that, or maybe Sherry did, but basal insulin is kind of like the amount that's always secreted. And so in people who do not have diabetes, we're constantly secreting a little tiny bit of insulin 24 seven all the time. Um, but then when we get a spike of blood sugar because we've eaten something or stress hormone or whatever, we secrete more. So the basal is kind of the constant supply of blood glucose and the bolus is when we've encountered something to raise our sugar acutely, like a meal. And so the basal would be given as say a long acting insulin, such as like Lantus. Um, and then the bolus would be given as a short acting insulin um, or a rapid acting insulin. So this would be given like, maybe if you check your blood sugar and it's 400, you're going to give yourself some rapid acting insulin. And I know that that is horrible drawing, but that's kind of what you would plan for. Um, so let's see if I can go to the next slide. Okay. And so the idea with that, say this, this picture here is that same man where we had um, 35 units total. We would have 17 and a half units of it that would be this kind of basal level, which shown in the blue. And then we would use the other 17 and a half units to be split over this bolus insulin. Um, and so the bolus is given, when you look at your breakfast, you can count how many carbs you're going to eat and you would titrate your insulin to give yourself, to cover those carbohydrates that you're going to eat. And so you're going to have um, a, a basal level of insulin and then you're going to add additional insulin that's rapid acting to cover those meals. That's what we call it. We say cover those meals. So that's what we would be doing there. Um, as far as insulin regimens go, I recommend watching this video if you weren't there for Sherry or just to get some more clarification on it, but there's fixed regimens, flexible, and then continuous infusion. And what's shown kind of in this picture is a fixed regimen. And during a fixed regimen, and I have this on the upcoming slides as well, um, you give the same amount of a bolus for insulin every single day. So for example, maybe you're giving 10 units bolus when you eat your breakfast, 10 units bolus when you eat your lunch, 10 units bolus when you eat your dinner. And so you have to adjust your diet so that that insulin will cover. So what's adjusted is the diet, not the insulin. The insulin is fixed. The diet can hopefully be adjusted. Um, and so I'll show you kind of what these different looks, what this looks like. So constant dose of basal insulin, usually two injections a day, breakfast and dinner. And that's what was shown in the blue on the previous screen. And then um, basal and standard mealtime dose of rapid or short acting insulin, that's the bolus. So, okay, so I'm having to resume this recording. So I apologize if I am, Repeating myself, I had somebody ring my doorbell. Anyways, for fixed insulin plans, like I said, the dose of insulin is fixed. The And so you want to consume the same amount of carbs consistently because if you change your amount of carbs, you can't change the insulin you're taking or you're not really supposed to, and that could throw you off. For example, if you take the same amount of insulin every day, but you skip a meal, that could cause a very low blood sugar, which could be dangerous. Um, so with this type of dosing, you're really managing your carb intakes to control your blood sugar. And I'll go back, fixed insulin is not the best way. You don't get the tightest control with fixed insulin plans, but it's a good way for people who are just learning to manage the disease to kind of start out. Um, but it's definitely not the most ideal situation. Flexible. So flexible insulin plans, like they sound, provide a lot more flexibility. And so depending on what you are going to eat or what your blood sugar is when you test it prior to giving yourself insulin, you can adjust your insulin throughout the day. Um, 
So for example, if you're going to eat a very high carb meal, you could give yourself more insulin before that meal. If you check your blood sugar after a meal and it's still very high, you could give yourself more insulin to help bring that down. Um, and so in this regard, you're able to change both the insulin that you give and the amount of food that you eat. And this could also be very tailored to like activity levels or exercise or illnesses, et cetera. Um, but it does require, you know, multiple injections during the day. And it requires quite a bit of patient motivation. It requires knowledge of portions. It requires maybe carb counting or diabetic exchanges. Um, and it will require kind of some advanced knowledge. So this would be kind of a secondary teaching to the fixed insulin plan, but much better control. Continuous subcutaneous glucose monitors and glucose infusion, insulin infusion sets um, are often paired, not always, but almost often paired. And so what this is, is it's similar to a flexible dose, but it uses a pump. And so you can program that pump, depending on what your blood sugar is, to give yourself different amounts of insulin. But the pump is very, very specialized and you can give units as small as 0 0.001. Um, many of these devices are paired with a continuous glucose sensor. And so the hope is that the continuous glucose sensor will send a signal to your pump and or like a smart device, like a smartphone, will let you know what your blood sugar is. And then you can dose your insulin based on that. Your pump can be used to give you bolus and basal insulin levels. Um, and should respond to high and low blood glucose levels. For example, some pumps have alarms. So when your blood sugar is really low, it prevents the pump from releasing any more insulin. Um, and that's kind of a self-checking device so that when you have a low blood sugar, your pump doesn't continue to give you insulin and make your blood even lower. This is a pretty good video from Medtronic about their pump but I believe Shelly gave you guys a pretty good explanation. Um, but we can watch just a little bit of this if it will transfer. Okay. 
Um, yeah, I know that is an advertisement from the company, but sometimes they make the best videos. They showed kind of that smart system where the pump would stop giving insulin if the blood sugar gets too low. A huge benefit to this is that you're continuously monitoring blood sugar. So instead of only getting blood sugar readings, maybe one time a day, four times a day, seven times a day, or nine times a day, you're literally getting blood sugar readings all the time, data that you can access um, all the time. So you can see what your blood sugar does during the day and there's less chances for you to miss a high blood sugar or a low blood sugar, which are pretty commonly missed when you're just doing finger sticks. And I have a image of that on the next slide, kind of how that could happen. So the continuous blood glucose monitor um, allows us to get just constant feedback. And this feedback could be, like I said, sent to your smartwatch, your smartphone, could be sent to your endocrinologist, um, parents, this can be sent to a parent's phone. So if their child is wearing one of these, they can be getting notifications of what their child's blood sugar is, which is just really reassuring when a parent maybe can't be there because a parent's at work. And so there's lots of benefits of these. Um, unfortunately, not all insurances pay for them. Sometimes you have to jump through a lot of hoops to get them. It is a mechanical electronic device. So we know if Kareen was operating it, she'd probably fail. No, just kidding. But um, electronic devices, you know, they do require batteries. They can fail. The line can kink. Things can happen. They've done so much innovation to prevent things from happening, but it still could happen. So kind of some pros and cons. I did talk about pros a little bit, but better glycemic control, no constant finger sticks. It's acting more like your pancreas would by constantly monitoring your blood sugar and then sending signals to that pump to release insulin. It allows much more flexibility for meals, for exercise. There's lower risk of um, hypoglycemia and there's generally better quality of life for people who have the pump. Um, although not everybody wants a pump, cons to the pump, it is a physical device that you wear on your body. So unlike the using a finger stick, you actually have this attached to your body. Um, you can have the glucose monitor attached to your stomach, as in this picture, many people will wear them on their arms. So in the case that it's on your arm, it would be potentially visible to the public. Some of the older versions of the de these devices were quite chunky, um, you know, like the size of hockey puck or, you know, really, really big kind of devices. Now they're getting smaller and smaller and the better insurance you have, kind of the more advanced device you can get. Um, other things I mentioned, potential mechanical problems, kinkage of the line, um, et cetera. So that could happen as well. But in general, it is really, really kind of revolutionary as far as diabetes control goes. Because what you can see in this image is with a continuous blood glucose, you get to see every time you're high or every time you're low. And your meter, you can set alarms for your meter. I talked about the alarm for low blood sugar, but you can also set an alarm for a high blood sugar. So say you've got a continuous glucose monitor and your sugar goes above 140, you could have an alarm for that so that a signal is sent to you um, and you can adjust your insulin dose to cover that blood glucose. Where if you're only monitoring finger sticks in this particular image, the finger sticks that they happened to check were actually pretty normal the entire time, but they missed some of these highs and lows that were actually happening because they weren't always monitoring. So in general, this is the way treatment is going. Um, and I just hope there's more availability for people from all demographics, any insurance type, you know, things like that. So some side effects of diabetes and insulin. Um, if you give too much insulin, hypoglycemia can occur. And I know um, Sherry talked a little bit about some of the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, but I have those listed there. You can die from a low blood sugar. You will die from a low blood sugar quicker than you will die from a high blood sugar. So when it comes to low blood sugars, our body doesn't have very much wiggle room as to how low it will tolerate before cell death happens. Um, when it comes to high blood sugar, we have kind of a bigger allowance for how higher blood sugar can go. 
Weight gain is a side effect. It is an anabolic hormone, so it can cause weight gain by allowing you to utilize all your macronutrients by storing fat, by using glucose, um, et cetera. And what I see a lot, especially with my dialysis patients, is they have gained weight. So then they end up taking more insulin because if you've gained weight, you're generally going to need more insulin. Think of some of those body weight to insulin ratios I talked about. They then take more insulin, which causes them to gain more weight. And it insulin prevents lipolysis, remember? And lipolysis is breakdown of fat. So when they take more insulin, that prevents breakdown of fat, so they never lose fat. And if they overeat, they gain more weight, and then they need more insulin, and it's kind of this vicious cycle. And so some theories on why we gain weight, and there are a million theories on why we gain weight, but some theories on why we gain weight actually include insulin as kind of one of these culprits for weight gain um, and kind of insulin resistance where we make insulin, but it doesn't work that well. So we make more and more and more insulin and it still can kind of cause this weight gain. Other things that can happen, lipohypertrophy at site of injection. So since insulin is anabolic, it can cause fat production. And so in the far right photo, you see um, kind of over this person's thighs, some almost like tumor-like bulges. And what those are, are areas where this person has been injecting insulin. This person has been using an intramuscular site. Intramuscular sites, you absorb the insulin quicker. It's um, more painful, but you do absorb the insulin quicker. So this person has been using um, an intramuscular site and what happens is since it's anabolic, it causes fat to grow. So there's literally growths of fat at that site where he's been or she's been, um, they've been injecting insulin. Um, and that is potentially probably a relatively unsightly type of thing. So now I'm trying to make this go away, but it won't. Okay. Um, that's just going to stay there for a minute. So what they do to prevent this is something really cool. I mean, they'll do lots of different things, but they'll teach you to inject your insulin at a different site each day. And so in the middle picture, I have these different patterns of when and where you should inject your insulin. So you can do kind of like a clockwise thing. You can do kind of like an infinity shape. You can do a zigzag shape. You can do a picket fence shape. And then on the far left, um, these are tiny little tattoos. And so you could stick these tiny little tattoos on your skin. Maybe it was your belly or maybe it was your thigh. And each time you give yourself insulin, you rub off one of those little tiny tattoos, they're temporary tattoos, and you know you've used that site. And then you use the next tattoo site, the next tattoo site. And so once all your tattoo sites have gone, you know you've used all these different sites to inject your insulin and you um, get more tattoos. So that's another method that they sometimes use to having you space it out. Low blood sugar symptoms, definitely be aware of some. Here's a picture to help you guys um, remember them. And then hypoglycemia, if you give yourself too much insulin, hypoglycemia can result. Um, and this is, yeah, this is relatively common. It can also be due to not eating enough. So in the case of that fixed insulin dose, remember I said, if you skip a meal, this would be problematic. If you gave yourself your normal breakfast dose of insulin and then you decided not to eat your breakfast, then you're going to have not enough carbs and too much insulin. So if you've skipped a meal or if you eat the meal that's say you are like, oh, never mind, I don't, I don't have time to make breakfast. I'm just going to drink this coffee. They didn't put sugar in that coffee, so there was no carbs. Um, other things that can cause hypoglycemia, too much exercise. We're going to talk about that. Hypoglycemia, it can be kind of a different number for everybody, but generally it's 70 or below. Some people will not feel symptomatic until they're much lower than 70. Some people will feel symptomatic even at 80 or 90, but generally it's kind of like 70 or below. Um, with regards to exercise, exercise is a little bit complicated. Exercise itself acts to lower blood sugar, especially um, 
low intensity exercise, such as walking or light jogging or riding a bike or doing the elliptical or maybe going for a swim, um, that type of exercise that's kind of low, low intensity does lower blood sugar. Um, if you're doing very high intensity exercise, or if there is kind of a psychological nervous reaction, or not nervous, even like anxious reaction to the exercise, um, you can actually have a high blood sugar from some of those counter-regulatory hormones. So um, a really good example of that I can think of that I've seen in real life is I like to race. I do obstacle races. One girl that I like to race with or that I've raced with before um, has type 1 diabetes. And so the last race I did with her, we're standing at the starting line. The race hasn't even started yet. She checks her blood sugar before the race. It's in the 300s. And so what happened in that situation is she was so kind of excited um, adrenaline was fueling her. She was, you know, waiting for this race to start. They did the pre-race speech. They're playing like the pre-race music. Everybody's getting pumped up and she's got these counter-regulatory hormones like cortisol and epinephrine going through her system. Her blood sugar increases. She hasn't even exercised, but she's in a tricky situation because she knows she's about to go run and this particular race was 12 hours so running in theory should bring down her blood glucose so if she gives herself insulin now and then she goes and runs will that bring down her glucose too far and she'll end up hypoglycemic um what she ends up doing is not giving herself glucose for the first part of that race the race is in five mile increments so she does not give herself or sorry, she does not give herself insulin for that first part of the race um, because that first part of the race, she's just really pumped up and she hasn't kind of gone to her normal. So she waits till the first part of the race is over and she doesn't have as high levels of epinephrine, norepinephrine, cortisol, et cetera, she rechecks her blood sugar to see what it kind of really is without these counter-regulatory hormones. And then she decides, am I going to give myself insulin or not based on this blood sugar now that I'm kind of more relaxed? Um, but I've heard of professional athletes, hockey players, CrossFitters, you know, things like that where the game is really intense, football players, where they've actually had a really high blood glucose level during the exercise or because of the excitement of exercise, they've given themselves insulin to counteract that high blood glucose level. And they've actually died during the night because the long-term effect of exercise is to lower blood sugar. And they over-treated that high glucose um, in the beginning, which caused them to now have insulin on board and then get hypoglycemia in the middle of the night because exercise causes those GLUT fours to stay at the cell longer. Insulin allows us to use those and all the glucose goes into the cell. There's not enough glucose um, outside the cell, et cetera. So yeah. So exercise is a little complicated and it depends how intense the exercise can be. Um, other things, regular meal patterns I've talked about, don't skip meals. Snacks between meals, if you're gonna have a snack and it has a carb, you probably need to take glucose to cover that or you need to take insulin to cover that, sorry. If you are having a snack but it does not contain a carbohydrate and you took insulin, you could have hypoglycemia. Um, extra, extra snacks for exercise. So this is another kind of question mark. Exercise, like I said, the long-term consequence of exercise is to lower blood sugar. So a lot of times people when they're first diagnosed with diabetes are told if you're exercising you have to eat more you have to eat more carbs you have to eat more food you have to constantly fuel your body 15 grams of carbs every 15 minutes something like that to counteract your blood sugar going too low um but in some cases athletes just literally can't keep up with how much they need to eat to work out and so sometimes a better strategy, and this would be an advanced strategy for somebody who's very in tune to how their body responds to insulin um, and blood sugar and exercise, but sometimes an advanced strategy would actually be to lower insulin dose during prior to exercise 
expecting exercise to kind of act as like almost like a natural insulin. Um, so that's kind of one of the strategies. And if you need to raise blood sugar, the best thing to do is eat the simplest carb possible. So a carb that's liquid, a carb that's gel, um, a carb that's just going to be absorbed across your enterocytes or into even your gums um, in your mouth, your, your mucous membranes, not something with fiber, not something with fat, not something with protein, something that's literally just like liquid sugar. And so the classic recommendation is orange juice. That's Corrine's pet peeve because it's really bad for kidney patients. And a lot of my kidney patients are diabetics. Um, you can buy glucose tablets. You can buy glucose gel. You can drink a soda. You can have apple juice. You can have honey. You could have corn syrup. Um, you can have, you know, maybe like an easy to eat type of a candy, things like that. But you need something to bring your blood sugar up quickly if it's dropping too low. Um, this pen, this is not an Appy pen. Um, this is a glucagon pen. Um, so if your blood sugar goes too low, you could give yourself glucagon injection. Um, and that will help bring your blood sugar up as well. Okay, insulin and hyperglycemia. So the opposite, hyperglycemia is high blood sugar. Insulin does not cause hyperglycemia unless you don't give enough of it. So insulin does not cause hyperglycemia. The risk with insulin is hypo. Um, but if you don't give yourself enough or you overeat, you could have hyper. If you have an infection, trauma, stress, or illness, you often have high blood sugar, even in people who are not diabetic, due to the counter regulatory hormones such as cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, um, the stress hormones that are released in response to these kind of stressful situations do cause a hyperglycemia. And often for people who are diabetic, especially type 1 diabetes, they will recognize that they start to have high blood glucose levels before they can even detect their ill. So they might start having high blood glucose levels two, three, four days before they begin to be symptomatic with an illness such as a cold or the flu. And so often that's kind of their first alert. Hey, you might be getting sick, your blood sugar's high. See if you can do some self-care right now to try to regulate that. When you're sick, there are special sick day recommendations, and this is a big part of diabetes education, is educating for what to do on sick days. Because often when people are sick, they don't feel like eating, and sometimes people think, I'm sick, I didn't eat, I probably shouldn't take my insulin because I didn't eat and I don't wanna to get too low. But it's actually the opposite effect. You still should take your insulin on a sick day even if you're not eating because some of these counter-regulatory hormones can cause your blood sugar to get so high, it's almost as if you are eating. And they recommend if you have a poor appetite to at least try to drink something, um, some carbohydrate type drink, anything. Um, if your blood sugar is low, but if it's high, don't drink anything that's high. So if your blood sugar is low, you have to make sure that you're eating. If your blood sugar is high, continue to hydrate because hydration is important and allows us to you know, manage blood sugar and acid base, but don't drink more sugar. So you're going to kind of check and then check your blood or urine for ketones. Since really high blood sugar is common with sickness, you want to see if you have ketones building up and if your body's becoming kind of acidotic, et cetera, if they're spilling into your urine. Um, so those would be some of the sick day regulations. Treatment. Okay. Goal nutrition therapy. Obtain optimal metabolic outcomes, blood glucose, A1C, lipid values. Um, I went over the blood glucose, A1C, and lipid values in lab. But these would be things to monitor and to put in your ADIMES as like success if A1C less than seven, success if um, postprandial blood glucose less than 180, success if LDL cholesterol less than 100, success if HDL over 50, um, things like that. Having blood glucose, A1C, lipid values, and weight all within normal and optimal ranges help prevent long-term complications of diabetes. And I could say that for both type one and type two diabetes. 
And that's one of our main goals is to prevent complications, both acute complications like hypo or hyperglycemia, and then long-term complications of diabetes. And so education and individualized care is very important. You have to consider health literacy. You have to consider access to ability to cook. You have to consider access to healthy food choices. You have to consider barriers to change, willingness to change, cultural preferences, um, et cetera, when you're talking about diabetes with a patient or a family. And generally, especially with younger patients and type 1, it has to be the whole family that you do the MNT with. It's not just the patient because often the parent is checking the blood sugar, the parent is buying the food, the parent is portioning the lunch, the parent is monitoring, et cetera. Um, and so it's really important to have kind of tailored education that includes the whole family. DSME, this is one of your abbreviations, Diabetes Self-Management Education. Again, this would be with a multidisciplinary team. I talked about the team previously, but it could include a nurse, a doctor, a PA, um, and a nurse practitioner, a pharmacist, a certified diabetes educator, um, social worker, et cetera. This would be paid for by Medicare and most private insurances. And this is generally kind of a group therapy where you're learning things. And you're not only learning from the teacher, but you're learning from other group members as to what they've experienced, what they've learned, et cetera. Um, so you'd be learning portion control, you'd be learning carb counting, you'd be learning insulin ratios, you'd be learning sick day management, you'd be learning signs and symptoms, hypo, hyperglycemia, um, et cetera. All right, so that would be DSME. Other treatments, nutrition therapy and diet. Um, I would actually like to save this for class. So I think we will resume talking about this in class and we'll also go over complications um, of diabetes. But some of the nutrition therapies that we're using are carb counting and diabetes exchanges. Okay, so I will see you in class on Tuesday, not Thursday, and thanks for listening and I'll talk to you soon.